a total eclipse of the sun, visible today over North America for the last time in this century. This is an ABC News special. Live coverage of the solar eclipse. Now from New York, here is correspondent Frank Reynolds. Good morning. This is indeed a special events broadcast of a genuine special event. The last total eclipse of the sun over the continent this century. The moon is moving between the sun and the earth and across a relatively narrow strip of the northwestern United States and central Canada. What you are seeing now is a picture taken from the Goldendale Observatory. And it is, it's showing the eclipse of the sun over Portland, Oregon. It is approximately 75% or so of uh, totality. Now, in about 12 minutes or so, Portland is going to go dark. Look at it right now. As you can see it, uh, the eclipse over Portland at the moment is about 75% or so. But uh, Portland is covered with a cloud cover, which is not at all unusual for this time of year. Some people say for almost any time of the year. We showed you the picture just a few moments ago when it was approximately 75% of totality and it was quite bright. Now Portland is getting dark. Oh, look at this. Look at this. It's midnight in Portland. We're at the eclipse. Frank, it's eerie. It's black here, getting to be totally black. Darkness at noon or midnight, as you called it. <laughs> People are hushed in what almost seems like a ritual thing that mankind has been silenced by in awe since the beginning of civilization. And we're now just seconds away from totality. Or the sun eclipsed by the moon. Frank, Listen to this the... is... Go ahead, Ron. Frank, this is absolutely oh, amazing. There, it is. there you can see it. Uh, the, the roar of the crowd has just gone up. This is just the most exciting thing I think I've ever uh, participated in. This is the best picture we've had yet. This is the best. Frank, I can't tell you how lucky we are. There have just oh. been thousands of people running around the Rocky Mountains, going as much as four and 500 miles during the night, trying to find a hole in the uh, clouds. We were told there'd be a total cloud cover here. And as you can see, somebody's on our side uh, this morning. I think I see the diamond ring effect at 6 o'clock and again at, uh, at 11. I think so. <laughs> or 10. No, it's 11. The light here is eerie. It's a uh, yellowish gray on the horizon. Uh, and I just hope that those people who've traveled through the Rocky Mountains all night are, are enjoying this eclipse as much as we are here. Well, I'm quite sure that they are. Gee, after making all that effort to get to a place where even just a few clouds could blot out a site that, we must remind you again, will not be seen on this continent in uh, this century. Not until, let's see, what is it, August 21st, 2017 or so? You know, Frank, be able to see another one. mentioning uh, that kind of time span, I was uh, talking to a scientist who said on the average an eclipse will happen in the same place perhaps every 360 years. And I was just wondering, uh, thinking about what this area was like 360 years ago. A few uh, French trappers, Crow and Blackfeet Indians, mm -hmm. and, uh, and now we have people uh, running around the Rockies in their cars trying to find it. I wonder what it's going to be 300 years from now. You wonder what the reaction was of the people who saw it, too, at that time. Precisely. Yeah. Now it's beginning to move oh, away, isn't it, Ron? There, yes, There's now, the, now the city oh, is coming to that. light again. <laughs> isn't that amazing? Portland <laughs> once again, quickly, see if it's uh, become light there again. Can we do that? Hey, there we are. Welcome back to daylight, Portland. <laughs> so that's it, the last solar eclipse to be seen on this continent in this century. And as I said, not until August 21st, 2017, will another eclipse be visible from North America. That's 38 years from now. May the shadow of the moon fall in a world at peace. And ABC News, of course, will bring you a complete report on that next eclipse 38 years from now. I want to thank everybody involved in this magnificent undertaking. It's been just great. We've had a lot of fun. This is Frank Reynolds in New York, and we'll have a complete report on the world news tonight. The Solar Eclipse, an ABC News special, was brought to you by American Express Traveler's Checks. Don't leave home without them. This has been a presentation of ABC News. <laughs> okay. I think I speak for everyone in here when I say, when did the last 38 years go? So if you dialed in late, on August 21, 2017, a little less than four months from right now, a total solar eclipse is coming to the United States. 
This is the first eclipse that hit the U.S. mainland since 1979. It's also the first eclipse to cross the U.S. from west coast to east coast since 1918. And it's the first solar eclipse exclusive to the United States. It doesn't touch any other landmass other than the United States since the country was founded in 1776. And because it's occurring in the era of social media, this eclipse has the potential to be the most widely observed, the most filmed and photographed, the most studied and documented, and the most appreciated astronomical event in human history. In fact, NASA thinks that it could rival the 1969 moon landings as a landmark event for a new generation. Now, solar eclipse occurs, of course, when the moon comes between the sun and the earth, blocking the sun's light, causing it to go dark during the day. You can see here a, a very basic diagram of a solar eclipse where the moon blocks out the light of the sun and you have the shadow of the moon cast upon the earth. Now the shadow is two components. There's the penumbral shadow, which is the partial shadow. Most of the hemisphere will see a penumbral eclipse or a partial eclipse. And then you have this very narrow umbral cone, which is where totality occurs. So the penumbra is partial and the umbra is total in this diagram. And to see a total eclipse, of course, you've got to be in the umbral shadow. Now, because the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted at a five degree angle with respect to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, we don't see solar eclipses every time there's a new moon. Ernie Wright of NASA has created several videos illustrating this. Uh, Ernie is uh, with NASA, and you can see here the relative sizes of the moon and the Earth, and just how rare it is to get that alignment so that you have a solar eclipse. The shadow is very narrow. Now, there are basically three types of solar eclipses. There is a partial eclipse, and like the name implies, it's when the moon is, only blocks part of the sun's disk. There's what's called an annular eclipse, and that's when the moon is at apogee, its furthest point in its orbit around the Earth, and it doesn't completely eclipse the sun, so it forms an annulus or ring. Not to be confused with annual, it's annular, which is the Latin term for ring. And then, of course, there's a total solar eclipse, which is what we're going to see on August 21. Now, experientially, if you were to rank these three eclipses on a scale of 1 to 10, a partial would be a 3, an annular would be a 7, and a total would be a 10 million. <laughs> There's absolutely no comparison at all between being in the path of totality and seeing a total eclipse or being outside the path. You hear people talk, what's it going to be like in Memphis? Are we going to see an eclipse here? It'll be about 92% partial. We say, well, I'll just stay in Memphis because I'll see a 92% total eclipse. You're not going to see a 92% total eclipse. You're going to see a 92% partial eclipse, and it's not going to be the same. There's going to be two groups of people in this country on August 21. Those that are in the path of totality, those that are not. You're either going to be in the dark or you're not going to be in the dark. There's just no way around it. It literally is the difference between day and night. So you've got to get into the path of totality to see the August 21 solar eclipse. And you can see it right here. Because the moon's shadow is so narrow, it crosses the country in a 66 mile wide path from the west coast of Oregon to the east coast of South Carolina, and it crosses 12 states in between. It crosses the entire state of Oregon, Idaho, near the Snake River Valley, just north of Boise, Wyoming, Grand Tetons, Jackson Hole, Casper. It crosses the state of Nebraska. Missouri from St. Joseph down to uh, just south of St. Louis. Eclipse the southern tip of Illinois, the western tip of Kentucky. Tennessee, just north of Nashville. In fact, Nashville is entirely in the path. I'll show you a map of that in a second. Eclipse the western tip of North Carolina, and then across the South Carolina. And this video kind of shows you the vantage point from space, uh, the moon shadow crossing the country as the Earth rotates on its axis. Starts in Oregon, goes across. You can just see how small that umbral shadow is in the path of totality. And then, of course, it goes across the country. And, of course, you can see the partial eclipse as well, the penumbral shadow, which is most of the Western Hemisphere. 
Moving at about Mach 2, 1,700 miles an hour, it'll cross the country in 92 minutes from Oregon to South Carolina. That's it. And you can see this video right here showing you the relative sizes of the moon and the earth from space and just how rare it is to get that alignment of the earth and the moon, which is why solar eclipses are so rare. Bill's going to talk in more detail in the talk subsequent to this about eclipse cycles, the alignment of nodes, and actually predicting them, why we can predict them so precisely. All right, uh, Rick and I attended a conference in Carbondale, Illinois last June. Met a lot of interesting people there. Basically, all the eclipse celebrities were there, people who travel all over the world to get into the path of totality. There's a unique group of eclipse chasers that will go anywhere, anytime to see a solar eclipse. People from all over the world have been planning for this event years in advance. In fact, booking hotels over a year in advance to see this eclipse. That's how big a deal this is. And uh, we, we, we learned a lot about eclipses. There's a rich history of solar eclipses in this country going back to when it was founded, including this one that was written up in Sky and Telescope magazine a few months ago. This is the, uh, the solar eclipse of July 29, 1878. Anybody recognize that man right there? Yeah. That's Thomas Edison, all of 31 years of age. A year before he invented the electric light, but already world famous for his invention of the phonograph. And in fact, he invented something called a tassimeter during this eclipse that would supposedly measure the radiation from the corona. I don't know how successful it was, but he was actually part of this eclipse. And you can see the path of totality for the uh, 1878 eclipse relative to the one we're going to see in August. Both of them intersected near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. In addition to the logistical challenges of getting into the path of totality in 1878, you had to worry about some other things like not getting scalped by Indians. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but the experience of being in the path of totality was documented in Harper's Ferry. In fact, with this, uh, with this, doc with this picture here that was, um, that was drawn. And uh, St. George Stanley, who was in the Snake River Pass observing totality, described it as this experience. The scene was now one of surprising beauty. For Pikes Peak, far away to the south, still remained in sunlight, looming in rosy outline, while the horizon that a moment before was okra now glowed with red, gold, pink, and lilac. Stars and planets came out, while the corona, quote, gleamed with a pale nebulous light, and the heavens above acquired a shade of blue that mortal cannot describe. There's really no way to describe what it's like to be in the path of totality for a solar eclipse. In fact, it can be disturbing. Mabel Lomas Todd, famous author, wrote the book on total eclipses in 1894, amateur astronomer, described the reaction of some of the people that were in the path of totality. The Indians were badly frightened. Some threw themselves upon their, threw themselves upon their knees. Others flung themselves flat on the ground, faces down. Others cried and yelled in terror. One old man, more resourceful, stepped from the door of his lodge with pistol in hand, carefully directed his aim, and fired at the blotted luminary. Quote, it was unanimously voted that the timely discharge of that pistol was the only thing that drove away the shadow and saved them from the public inconvenience that would certainly have resulted from the entire extinction of the sun. <laughs> Think about it. People didn't know what was going on at that time. It can be really eerie to see the sun go black during the day. In ancient times, they thought that they had maybe upset the gods in some way, so they started beating pots and pans, cutting themselves with rocks, sacrificing virgins, and you know what? It worked every time. <laughs> so a solar eclipse, by the way, how many of you in here have ever seen a total solar eclipse? Has anybody actually seen one? Okay, a couple people. Not an annular, a total on a clear day, as in the corona. Okay, you'll put your hands down. So most of you in here have never seen a total solar eclipse. I've never seen one either. I was a week away from five when the last one occurred in the United States. So this is going to be a new experience for most of us. I took a course in astronomy in college when I was a freshman, and my, my professor at the time spent a good portion of the class period describing what it was like to be in a total solar eclipse. And then I also, the closest I've ever come to experiencing totality, I'll talk about that in a minute, 
But actually, the phases of the solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse can last several hours. It can last three or four hours. And the early phases, when the moon starts to move across the sun's disk, there's really not a whole lot that's happening. There's that initial bite out of the sun, and you really don't notice a difference in the sun's light, unless, of course, you're using some type of protective eyewear to see the partial phases of the eclipse. When you get to about 90% of a partial eclipse, then things start to get interesting. The light from the sun gets more and more fatigued. It resembles something very similar to what you would see as the sun is setting, or perhaps on a cloudy day, when you've got that you know, kind of uh, pale light that's fatigued and tired. And then when you get to about 99% of totality, uh, I'm sorry, 99% uh, of a partial eclipse, we get those last beams of sunlight that, that uh, shine through the deepest valleys on the edge of the moon. Uh, then it gets very, very interesting. You go from day to night in a very short period of time. You're literally plunged into a deep, eerie twilight in only 30 seconds. I bought my first high-definition television when I was you know, about 11, 11 years ago. and At that time, HD was brand new. I got stuck on the Discovery Channel, and they were actually showing footage of a solar eclipse off the coast of a South Pacific island. And it was really eerie because the, they had the high definition ca uh, camera, wide angle view, they showed the coastline and you could see the sun as the moon moved over. And it literally went from day to night in only a few seconds. And you could see totality occurring. So it really is a, a dramatic experience. Unlike anything, unless you're actually there to see it. Only anything we've ever experienced in our lifetime. That's what's gonna happen and of course, when totality occurs, you see the corona. Um, now, when you get close to totality, if you have leaves or perhaps pinholes in cardboard or paper, you'll see something called a pinhole effect, and you can see a picture of it here on the side of a house. Normally, when sun shines through, it's a full disk and it's full sunlight. If you're in Memphis, at maximum partial eclipse. We'll only get to 92% of uh, totality here. So it's not going to be 100%. We're going to be real close in Memphis. But you will be able to see an effect very similar to this. Those of, uh, you know, those of people who are foolish enough to stay behind and not get into the path of totality. <laughs> um, but you'll also see this in the path of totality as you reach totality. So it's, it's, it's kind of a unique um, effect. Now, totality occurs. Here you can see some pictures, uh, one by Fred Espinach. This was featured in the Sky and Telescope in uh, 2001. And another one in China back in 2008. A uh, lot of beautiful pictures of totality, you know, out on, on the internet and various sources. It doesn't get completely dark like, you know, midnight. It's like a deep twilight when totality occurs. Like, similar to what you would see when the sun sets 30 to 45 minutes after sunset. So this is the, these are just some images that's showing you an example of what totality is like in that uh, when, when, the, when the eclipse occurs. Uh, this is Mr. Eclipse himself, Fred Espinach. Rick and I met him back in Carbondale. Um, he is the foremost expert on really all eclipses, solar and lunar. Retired NASA, NASA astrophysicist. He's witnessed over 27 solar eclipses on all seven continents, including Antarctica. Since 1970, he observed one on the east, on the east coast of, um, of America and then made it kind of a, a mission in his life that he was going to make an effort to get into the path of totality for as many solar eclipses as he possibly could. So he has, he's literally traveled the world for the last 47 years observing solar eclipses. And of course, Fred is going to be honored next June, June the 20th, a stamp is coming out. It shows an image that he took from a solar eclipse, I believe in Libya in 2006, if I recall correctly. But uh, look for this stamp on June the 20th. If you touch it, it will actually turn from, moon, from, from, uh, from showing this image of the moon to showing uh, totality just by the heat of your finger. So thermal heat. Pretty interesting. Anyway. Fred observed a solar eclipse last year, March of 2016, in Indonesia. It was part of a cruise that they were on, and you know, 
it occurred, I think, just before noon, and he took footage of the experience of being in totality, showed it at the conference that Rick and I were at. And this is what it's like when totality occurs. Ombre's coming to the west. Look at our It's not going to rain, just the shadow of the moon. Filters off. You also get this beautiful sunset effect around the entire horizon during totality as you look out the edge of the moon shadow. Oh, look at What a promise. You see the prominence? Yeah. Okay. Five inches. Mercury. Mercury. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mercury, too. Oh, that's a killer promise. It's a little overwhelming during totality of what to look at because there's the corona, there are prominences, there are usually a few bright naked eye planets, uh, there's the, the twilight effect around the horizon. It's a very busy, uh, chaotic time. And now we've jumped to the last uh, 20 seconds of totality. The sky looks much darker now because now we're looking down, most of the shadow is in front of us as the edge of it approaches from the back. And you can see some of those clouds moving up on the sun now. We had a perfect timing there because the sun passed through those clouds about a minute after totality. All right, just before totality occurs, you get a phenomenon called Bailey's Beads, named after the astronomer Francis Bailey, I believe 19th century. He was the first person to coin this term. Basically, you have the last beams of sunlight shining through the deepest valleys on the edge of the moon's limb. And then the diamond ring is when that last stream of sunlight shines through the edge of the, uh, the deepest valley on the edge of the moon just before totality occurs. This is a good time to take your protective eyewear off and actually look at the sun. It's safe to look at the sun during totality and to see the transition from the diamond ring to the corona is really spectacular. And by the way, this is a good day. If you're thinking about proposing, August 21 is a great day. I mean, when else can you give a girl three diamond rings for the price of one, right? And then, of course, the sun's corona. This is the only opportunity in your lifetime that you will have to see the sun's corona. This is the tenuous outer atmosphere of the sun. We are actually part of the sun's outer atmosphere. So this idea of splendid isolation is a myth. I know the sun is 93 million miles away, but we are a participant in the activities of the solar system here on Earth. In fact, NASA is going to be doing some extensive studies of the solar corona during this eclipse. Because it's crossing the country, and because we have the technology to do it now, there are several experiments, including citizen experiments, that are going on to get footage of 92 minutes of the solar corona. But it's really a spectacular sight. You can see the moon here blocking out the uh, photosphere of the sun. You can see uh, the magnetic field lines and the prominences on the, uh, on the edge of the sun. Um, it's really a spectacular view. Again. I just want to say, during the partial phases, you need to have protective eyewear. And everybody here tonight is going to have the opportunity to get some uh, ISO certified eclipse glasses. But when totality occurs, if you're in the path of totality, look at the sun. This again is something my astronomy professor really hammered home to us. It's safe to look at the sun during totality. You've only got a couple minutes, but it's your once in a lifetime opportunity to see the solar corona. So when that moment of totality occurs, assuming you're in a place in the path where it's clear, it's going to be two minutes, roughly two and a half minutes of the most spectacular natural phenomenon you're ever going to witness. 
Now, why do we even get an opportunity to see the solar corona? Interesting fact, and this is kind of a disturbing fact in the world of astronomy. It turns out that from our vantage point here on Earth, the sun and the moon appear to be exactly the same size in the night sky. Now, obviously the sun is much larger than the moon, 400 times, but it's also 400 times further away. So the reason why we see the eclipses that we do is because the ratio of the moon and the sun in our sky is exactly the same. And astronomers have been kind of mulling this over for years. Is it just a coincidence that the earth and the moon, or that the sun and the moon are exactly the same, time, uh, same size in our sky? Or is there something else? <coughs> Turns out, I don't know what your belief is in life in outer space or not. There may be life out there. There may, be life, there may not be life out there. But we may be the only intelligent species in the entire universe that lives on a planet whose moon perfectly eclipses its sun during a total solar eclipse. We may be the only intelligent species in the cosmos that see these types of eclipses. And that gave us the opportunity as, uh, as sentient beings to prove one of the most remarkable theories in all of science. Really the work of a madman if you think about it. Einstein sits in his office for eight years and dreams up relativity, general relativity. Gravity is not a force, it's a, it's a distortion of the fabric of space and time due to the presence of matter. How on earth do you prove that? Well, it turns out during a total solar eclipse, if the sun is warping the fabric of space-time, stars from behind the sun, their light should be bent in its path to earth. Light only knows straight lines. How do you prove it? You can't look at it because the sun is too bright, but during a total solar eclipse, when the sun's light is blocked, you can actually measure the angle. And here you can see from Sky and Telescope, August of 2016, the angle that Newton's theory of gravity predicted and then Einstein's general theory of relativity predict predicted, which is almost twice as much. And sure enough, 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington made a trip to Princip off the uh, coast of South Africa and observed a total solar eclipse. He took this image right here, he measured the starlight and the angle of deflection from the starlight and proved that Einstein's general theory of relativity was right. It's one of the rare times in science when a scientist comes up with a theory by first principles, not empirical observations, not experimentation, just sitting in his lab, thinking it through, writing equations down, and he turned out to be right. Remarkable. And I love this quote right here. Stars, not where they seem to be or were calculated, but nobody need to worry. <laughs> In fact, there are going to be relativity tests during the, 21, the August 21 eclipse. Universities are going to be reenacting Einstein's general theory of relativity and actually measuring the starlight. There's a write-up in Sky and Telescope on how to do this. Uh, Kind of an interesting way to photograph an eclipse. I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about this, but um, uh, Tung Tenzel did this for an eclipse in Turkey. Basically, you fix a camera in one position, you take snapshots of the sun over the course of a year, culminating in a solar eclipse, and you can actually see the path that the sun traverses in our night sky. Uh, obviously, the sun doesn't move, we do, but from our vantage point on Earth, the sun traces a figure eight pattern called a tutelemma as it uh, goes around, as the sun, or, as the Earth orbits the sun throughout the course of a year. Um, but what's interesting is what's going to be visible during totality for the August 21 eclipse. Here you can see totality. We will have a shot to see the bright star Regulus in the constellation Leo and some bright naked eye planets. Mercury, probably not going to happen, very faint. Mars, possibly. But we will have a shot at Jupiter and Venus. So during totality, it can be a little overwhelming. You've only got two minutes. There's a lot to look at. Not only the corona and the dark sun, but look for some naked eye planets. Look for the star Regulus in Leo, just to the left of the dark sun. And then also look for, if you see any bright planets, it's likely going to be Jupiter or Venus, possibly Mars, Mercury, Probably not going to happen. Um, great website for learning about the total solar eclipse, greatamericaneclipse.com. 
This is the website that I've been directing people to. This is Michael Zeiler's website. He's, a, he's an Eclipse chaser and also a 30-year veteran of the GIS industry. He's got a lot of detailed apps and maps, as well as um, other material, t-shirts, um, sun oculars that you can use for viewing the solar eclipse. Anything you want as far as where to go, when, and what to have, accessories on the solar eclipse, you can get from this website. I'm just going to show you one app here. If you go down to future eclipses and you click here, it will take you to a page, and this is kind of interesting. It actually shows you eclipses that are coming up over the course of the next century, and you can see we got another one crossing in August of 2045. I'm getting ready for that one. Um, if you click here, you can download an app on your iPhone or your iPad and it will show you the path of totality and you can zoom in on the path of totality anywhere in the country and it will show you a detailed map. You switch from satellite view to map view, it will show you all the topography. And uh, you can zoom in here. Most of you know I like the Perryville slash Chester area as a possible spot to view it. But if you go, you can just uh, click anywhere along this path and it will tell you when totality is going to occur, you know, when the partial phases occur, when the start of totality is, when it ends, and then also duration. So near Chester, Illinois, which is where we're targeting, it's about two minutes and 40 seconds, very close to the spot of maximum duration. And then you also can see the shadow as it's moving in here. So this is a very interesting, very, very useful app. And of course, if you go a little bit further, uh, Carbondale is right here. Uh, Carterville is uh, just to the, it's just north of, um, of the center line. There you get two minutes and 32 seconds of, of, uh, of duration, of totality. So a very useful app on the, on the website, greatamericaneclipse.com. One of many. I love this website, Michael Zeiler. So it's, it's a great resource. There's other ones out there, but this is my favorite website. Um, of course, there's a lot of events being planned. Because it crosses the country, it hits so many major cities, there's, uh, there's many spots where you can view this eclipse. From Madras, Oregon, Casper, Wyoming, which is where a lot of the veterans are going to be. Um, St. Joseph, Missouri, they've got a major event planned at Rosecrans Memorial Airport. Um, Carbondale, St. Joseph, of course Hopkinsville, areas just north of Nashville. And they've been marketing this thing for over a year, a couple of years now. So this is a great money-making business opportunity for communities all along the path of totality. It's, it's, it's being called America's Music City Eclipse because uh, it touches so many different music, you know, Nashville, St. Louis, so many cities along the path. Uh, if you're into music, Carterville, Illinois might be an interesting choice. They're, they're doing something called Moonstock instead of Woodstock and Ozzy Osbourne hits the stage when totality occurs. <laughs> now I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better way to celebrate totality than with the Prince of Darkness himself, who made his debut the last time there was a solar eclipse in the United States. But see the, see the corona. I like Missouri. Um, it crosses from north to south. Most of I-70 is in the path as well as I-55, just north of Cape Girardeau. Mobility is going to be the key that day because you've got to get to where it's clear. It just seems like Missouri has a lot of options. Um, if you zoom in here, you can see this is a detailed map from GreatAmericanEclipse.com. Here's Carbondale, and of course just south of Carbondale, you're at the point of maximum duration. But it's also a wooded area. There's a lot of trees here, so it's, there's a lot of obstruction. If you go just a little bit further west, again, this is uh, Cape Girardeau up 55 to Perryville. And then if you take uh, this road up to Chester, this seems like a pretty good spot for viewing the eclipse. This is footage I took on August 21, 2016, one year to the day before the, the eclipse, Perryville, Missouri. Very nice wide open spot. It's empty that day, but of course on, on eclipse day it's going to be packed. If you go 12 miles north of where this is, you come to this spot, just south of Chester on the Illinois-Missouri border. There's a Conoco station there. And I like this spot because it's wide open. You don't have a lot of obstruction on the horizon. It's flat, and so you have the opportunity to not only see the dark corona of the sun, 
but also the deep twilight effect on the horizon. So I'm not saying that this is necessarily the spot, but I'm saying this is one of these spots that would be prime. Somebody needs to make sure that those lights don't come on automatically, or you might as well not be there. <laughs> right. Because a lot of lights do come on during eclipses and spoil things for people that haven't planned for that. Right. You want to be ideally out in an open field. If you can be around some... There might be 10,000 other people with the same plans for the same... There group. could be. There could be. Which is why I'm going to make a subsequent trip to this. I've been talking to Trish. She's planning a major event for Perryville. So she's got some spots kind of in mind. So I'm, I've been corresponding with her about other possibilities. So just kind of, kind of an idea of what we're thinking. Um, of course, Nashville is another great spot. You can see it's on just the southern edge of the path of totality. If you go just north, Gallatin is right near the center line. I know Rick has possible plans to go there, weather conditions pending. I think that's where you went to high school, isn't it? Uh, Hendersonville. Oh, Hendersonville. This is right there. Okay. And uh, they asked me to come MC. A, a, they've got a country. No, the singer was, uh, I kind of forgot her name. Was on a, the, one of the American Idols or something. And, uh, they're going to have a stage and bands. Wanted somebody to come up there and talk during the eclipse event itself. Apparently, whoever it was, they thought they had from uh, oh no, I can't believe this the university right there in Nashville. Vanderbilt. Uh, Vanderbilt apparently turned them down. So I was their second best choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So a lot, of, a lot of roads here. Now the traffic into Nashville might be an issue. The other thing is there's been an issue with wildfires in eastern Tennessee over the course of the last year. Something else to think about. You know, the further east you go, the riskier it gets weather-wise and then also potential for forest fires if you're near a, a wooded area. You know, they don't call them the Great Smoky Mountains for nothing. So something to think about. Now weather forecast, um, Sky and Telescope wrote an, wrote an article in the January 2016 edition. I'm not gonna get into a lot of details here, but um, Jay Anderson, who co-authored the article with Fred Espinach, Mr. Eclipse, is uh, an expert on weather. He's, he's really Fred's go-to person when it comes to weather. And he, got the, he had these two graphs um, for morning and then also afternoon, the probability of cloud cover. In general, the lower the line is, the better the prospects are weather-wise. And you can see this red line right here is for Casper, Wyoming, which is why a lot of the veteran eclipse chasers are, are, are targeting Casper, Wyoming as a potential spot. I believe Madras, Oregon has the best prospects, the best probability weather-wise for viewing the eclipse that day. So if you want to get into this in more detail, Fred goes through in his presentation basically how he breaks up the country into three meteorological zones from um, basically the first three or four states from Oregon to roughly Nebraska, and then from Nebraska all the way through to Tennessee and then all the way out to South Carolina. But um, weather is something, you know, obviously is going to be a factor. Now, this satellite image from August 21, 2016 looks very promising. It was an absolutely gorgeous day that day, mostly clear, near the path of totality. Of course, here's Missouri. You can see we had some clouds here in Tennessee. So near Nashville, it might be a little risky. I took these images on August 21, 2016 right around the time of totality. Totality occurs about 1.18 or so p.m. in the afternoon in Chester, Illinois. Now you can see about 12 minutes later, did have a few fair weather clouds moving in. So it scares me a little bit, partly cloudy day. Perryville, this is what it looked like at 10 a.m., a couple hours before totality. Got a video on our YouTube channel, memphisastronsociety.com of some of the footage I took that day, August 21, 2016. Yeah. How long did it take to drive between those two spots? Uh, well, this is 12 miles away. Okay. I didn't go right there. I went up to St. Genevieve and shot some video there. And I took one of the roads from St. Genevieve over to Chester before I went up 
So I kind of meandered around a little bit before I took these shots. So. But on, on the day of the eclipse, you're, you're, especially if you're in the path of totality, you may have trouble moving if you're not where it's clear. Yeah. Because I'm, if, if a bunch of people decide to move, Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why you want to be in or near the path on that day. Yeah? During this uh, totality, you need some background music. Uh, background music. I always remember Carly Simon's uh, song, old song, You're So Vain. And the guy went to Nova Scotia to see the total eclipse of the sun. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I did not know that. Um... August 22, this is what Carbondale looked like the following day. This is uh, Southern Illinois University. This, is, of course, is where NASA is hosting their major event. They're going to pack out the stadium. People on the Jumbotron are going to see the eclipse across the country. This is the kind of day that scares me. Um, partly cloudy because you're playing Russian roulette with the clouds. So if it's a day like this, partly cloudy would be kind of the worst weather forecast. It's either going to be clear or rain. You know, give me one or the other, but don't give me partly cloudy, because then I'm going to have a real tough time deciding. Yeah. Jeremy, hey, do you know how, what speed the shadow? 1,700 miles an hour. Seven, the, the shadow crosses the U.S. at 1,700 miles an hour? Yep. Miles a it's going to be wild. Fast. Well, yeah, I thought about. Setting the camera up on a hilltop so you can maybe catch <laughs> the shadow coming across the valley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not anything then. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about photographing the eclipse. If you've never seen a total solar eclipse, see it. Don't get bogged down in photographing the eclipse. They're, you know, the experts recommend just focus on seeing it. Get into the path of totality. Look at the corona. Don't worry about your equipment and then, you know, shooting, taking pictures, video, all that stuff. Having said that, uh, Fred Espinach did a webinar with Sky and Telescope. I purchased it, watched it. I have access to it over the course of the next year. If anyone is interested, let me know. We may do a follow-up talk to this one in August. I'm still debating. I've got to discuss it with the board on um, actually capturing the eclipse. We may get into more details on that. But um, Fred is an expert, of course. He's done this 27 times, and he's got a lot of ideas about how to capture the eclipse, whether you're going to with uh, pictures or with video. This is kind of the quick and dirty method. His wife, Pat Espinach, um, used a DL DSLR camera with a long lens, a solar filter, a sturdy tripod, and you know you can get some decent shots of, of the corona that way. So, you know, it would be nice to get some footage in the path of totality that day. And I think we should all make an effort to do that. There is a, a project out. This is one of, of several projects. It's called the, uh, the Eclipse Mega Movie Project. Basically, anyone with an iPhone or a camera can contribute to this. Go to this website right here, megamovie.com, uh, eclipsemega.movie. And really, the idea is anyone in the path from Oregon to South Carolina, take pictures or video, upload it to a website. They're going to stitch it together. And there's going to be two versions of the video that come out. The first one will come out right after the eclipse is over. So we'll have access to it. And I'm kind of thinking in my head, maybe September would be a good time to have a follow-up to the eclipse where we have video footage in the path. You know, Not only our experience being in the eclipse, but maybe people from around the country. I've got to think that through. But anyway, this is a project you can participate in or learn more about if you're interested. If not, we can always do our own MAS Eclipse Mega Movie Project. Um, this is a very cheap camera. You can get 350 bucks. It's you know full HD video. Fred recommends it. It's a it's a good kind of quick and dirty way to capture an eclipse. But the other thing is, most of us today have iPhones. I mean, technology has come a long way since 1979. You know, I have you know most of us have iPhones with full 1080p capability, and it shouldn't be that difficult to get some footage at the spur of the moment in the path of totality or during the eclipse. I've taken trips all over the country. My dad and I take road trips every couple of years and I've literally taken video all over the country. Grand Canyon, Bryce, Zion, Extraterrestrial Highway, Oregon Coast, uh, even New England in the fall. 
and it really is fairly easy today to get high quality video. So this is kind of what I'm proposing for Eclipse Day. And really it's just a matter of getting eight or nine people, you know, a dozen people or so to kind of raise their hand and say, yes, I will do this. And these are kind of the eight videos I'm envisioning. Gather them, stitch them together. I have a program for video editing and we can have a pretty cool movie of our experience being in the eclipse. So the first one is the diamond ring. Uh, that of course is right before totality when you see the diamond ring, ring effect on the edge of the moon. Uh, the totality and then the corona of course right you know during the actual totality itself when the eclipse occurs. Shadow bands. This is when the moon's shadow is sweeping across the horizon. Um, then the horizon and the twilight during totality you can see the deep twilight along the horizon. That would be a really neat video. Crowd reaction. Any interviews from people you know, who are experiencing the eclipse. If you're in a place where there's a lot of activities, video that. And then miscellaneous, anything else you want to capture. Get all the video footage, put it together, and then view it in a follow-up meeting for the Astronomical Society. So this is what I'm proposing. This is what I'm probably going to be pushing as we move forward and get closer to Eclipse Day. Any volunteers, let me know. But if you have an iPhone and you know how to take video, Again, it's like two buttons. Boom, boom, you're taking video. Very simple. Um, I want to thank John Jarrett and American Paper Optics for all their support. Everyone tonight has the opportunity to get uh, free solar eclipse glasses. I've also got these packets written up for, um, for the eclipse. That gives you all the details, including the path of totality, and then also when the partial and total phases occur. I've got 30 of these, so feel free to help yourselves at the break. Um, <laughs> American Paper Optics created the largest pair of 3D eclipse glasses in the world, right on the coast, right on the uh, the edge of the Mississippi River here. Of course, you can see the background, the pyramid, and then, and then the bridge. So, um, and they're working on a pair for us for not only this eclipse but the next one. Yes. Uh, the giant eclipse classes will be at the Pink Palace Museum for the majority of the summer. So if you want oh, to come cool. take pictures with them, awesome. Come check them out. I did not know that. Yeah. So they're there. They're at they the Pink Palace. They will be here. They will be here. Very, very good. So and and John is of course working on a on an order for us. So I'll go ahead and end with this. Mabel Lobos Todd again, talking about the experience of being in a total solar eclipse. Quote. I doubt if the effect of witnessing a total eclipse ever quite passes away. The impression is singularly vivid and quieting for days and can never be wholly lost. A startling nearness to the gigantic forces of nature and their inconceivable operation seems to have been established. Personalities and towns and cities and hates and jealousies and even mundane hopes grow very small and very far away. I will promise you one thing. If you're in the path of totality, and you see the total solar eclipse, once it ends, your immediate reaction will be, when is the next one? We got one coming less than seven years from right now. Already preparing for that one. We got another one crossing the country on April the 8th, 2024. So we're pretty lucky. It's been a 38 and a half year hiatus, but in less than seven years, we got two shots at a solar eclipse easily within a couple hours drive from Memphis, Tennessee. So we're pretty lucky to be living in these times. Thank you. We'll take a break. <laughs> Guys, I've also, got, um, I've also got eclipse guides. This is a four page document talking about pre preparing for the eclipse. I got 25 of these. Michael Bockage wrote this. He's the one who's hosting the event at Rosecrans Memorial airport so feel free to take these as well there's also an electronic version of this on every MAS newsletter so come on down and help yourselves We've got, uh,